Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to the session. The name of the session is Nature-Based Solutions for Water Security, Water Sector's ro uh, Leadership Role. Um, you know, a quick uh, introduction well, of the ses session description. We have uh, three, uh, three cases being debated in this session. Uh, on how the water sector can exert leadership, catalyzing stakeholders, mainstreaming the use of nature-based solutions for water security. Uh, these cases explore um, the leadership of this, the, the water sector in, in adopting nature-based solutions. So there'll be three cases, Sao Paulo, Quito, and Cape Town. Uh, Sao Paulo metropolitan area repeatedly fa faces critical water supply challenges, but the water sector regulation is taking the lead to promote change in how the sector operates. In Cape Town, removing invasive species from sources, source waters is to increase the water availability by, by one sixth of the, uh, of the city's needs. And in Quito, Water sources are being restored and, and maintained on, of, for, for long-term flow and improvement of water quality results. So in this context, the Nature Conservancy plays a leverage role, providing science-based support for decision-making and promoting outreach among stakeholders. Uh, in this three case presented, the engagement of the water sector is a game changer. So um, I will present our, um, our speakers from um, Marco Cardoso Tsuyama. He is the regulation specialist of RCESP, the Public Service Re Regulatory Agency of Sao Paulo, the state of Sao Paulo in Brazil. He's former executive secretary of climate change, Capixaba Forum, and has a PhD in energy. It's author of Searching for Petroleum in Sweden. Um, well, that said, Marco, I am, you, you have the floor, so you can start your presentation. Feel free to, to share your screen. Okay, thank you very much. I will share my screen. Oh, sorry. Uh, Um, just a minute, please. Can you see? Yeah, you can put it in full screen mode. Yeah, but I would like to, to know if you if you feel okay. Yeah, we see your screen. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm from Sao Paulo. I'm, I'm, um, I'm regulator specialist of uh, RCSP, that it's, it's the agency that regulates that regulates us, um, uh, service public service in, in, in Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is, is the uh, most populated uh, state of Brazil. And it's uh, we have um, a lot of problem regarding uh, regarding the, the water supply, especially in, in the most populated areas. And so we are. I'm very proud to to present this case. I I start to 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 work with Claudio, and uh, and uh, but. Uh, I think that it, it's evol ev evolving a lot. Okay. Well, I think that uh, we have a problem in when we had a problem. In fact, we had a problem at the past because most of people used to to question if uh, if it is our rule as a public service regulation to to take care of this the 
the raw material of the, the of the the water supply uh, public service. That's I think that is it's a kind of strange because uh, how can you 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 run the the assure the the re, re bit of of um, of the the supply chain if you don't care um, uh, about the, 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 the this preservation and so I think it's a very strange thing but uh, I think that is now consolidated that the, because uh, recently one the new uh, regulatory framework said that the, the bulk uh, water supply is 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 included in the in the in the, the regulation uh, water supply model and so I think that's it's kind of uh, I I wonder I expect that uh, it is uh, it's solved and so most uh, beyond the beyond the the should the, the, the public serves uh, the water supply. We have also to assure the, the water uh, security because it's not uh, only to, to this industry that uh, uh, water is important. And uh, so you, you have um, a lot of much, uh, a lot of uses uh, to, to water and all of them needs to, to to have a, a, a water supply. And so we have also the problem of the climate resilience because we, you know, we know that a lot of uh, the, the draw the draw climate uh, extreme will be more, more and more um, uh, frequently. And uh, so it's, uh, we, have, we have to take care of this. I am right now in Guarujá and uh, we have, uh, we are you know, auditing the, the, the water public company and uh, they say, oh, we, uh, we don't have, we, we didn't, we don't have solution because there's no water. The users are um, are protesting, but uh, there, there, there's no water, and so we have to to keep to to take care of this this sort this, uh, this the sources the water source, and well, well it's not a only it's not a only the. the when when uh, there is a sort of shortage of uh, shortage of uh, water, it's not a problem. It's not a, only a, a, a problem to the population. It's also a problem to to the company, to the utility company, and so it's part of the business, uh, the the business of the water company to 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 to, to keep it flowing well said so that we had um, we had to to uh, we have uh, working on that uh, since uh, 2019 um, we have uh, uh, established we we're trying, we're designing a model, a regulation model uh, that incorporates investments in, in protection of water sources. And here in Brazil, we have a, a very um, critical component that is the affordability because we are in, the, in, a, in, a, in a development uh, country and uh, most of people uh, used to to care more about the the costs, but uh, in fact, uh, it's it's you 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 if you have uh, the narrow view, um, 
you may say, okay, it costs more, a little more, but in the long term, it will be because when when something and anything, some some good, uh, where there's some short shortage of some good, any good, the prices rises, rises, and so uh, it's it's not. Uh, uh, I think that it's uh, you, we have to 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 have a long term view, and uh, we had. And I'm, I'm very proud of that. I'm very, very, very proud. Oh, we, at first we 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 made a re research, development, innovation program in 2019, and uh, and it, it it was very good. It was so it's a very um, It, it's I'm it I'm at the protection of water source sourced by deploying a natural based solution such as ecosystem restoration and best management and I, the new as I said before the new sanitation legal framework uh, just uh, reassure our 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 idea and. Uh, our idea that we we don't have only to to we don't have to restrict our uh, um, our activities to to the service distribution or uh, transportation. We have to 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 keep in mind uh, the 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 supply the the, the source. And we now we we this just a description a, a visual description of of our activities and uh, our set said they have available amount of based uh, based on required uh, revenue and Sabespi uh, so Sabespi uh, proposes water source. Oh, well, that's important because the Sabespi that it's they work they are work Sabespi is the company the Chilean company of of, uh, of water in Brazil and they proposes the, the project because they know where, where it's critical and uh, they propose water source conservation. We are Sabespi and CIMA, the government department. Uh, Assess and approve the water, the projects. Uh, Sabesp executes the, um, the projects and reports the progress and account of the of the, the projects. And uh, our Sabesp audits the projects. Our Sabesp audit audit the projects. Uh, also, we have we have a technical comp. A cooperation agreement that involves C, uh, the, the government department, CIMA, RCS with the agency, SABES with the utility company, and two, uh, two non governmental organizations. Um, but of course, in Brazil, we have a, a law that might be followed uh, strictly, and uh, we have the, the, the general. The approval of general attorney. Um, uh, that's that's the that's uh, I uh, I stood that's the study we have to to make it clear. It we have two movements in in this way. We, we have the the the, the this uh, agreement that you got two minutes, Marco. Okay, yeah, I'm finishing. We, we have two, uh, two, two, two movements. We have this technical cooperation agreement and uh, that involves uh, this, this comp these organizations. And we have the, 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 the pilot project. And uh, the, this, this 
this uh, memorandum of understanding uh, study the, the, the issue and the, the, the pilot project put in, in, in uh, make it real. And we had these two, two movements and uh, we're, we're, we, are, we are going to, I think that it's a broad, there's a broad movement uh, that there's a narrow, there's a specific movement. And, and so I think that we can uh, think that uh, this project, uh, the, this issue is, is kind of, is at least we, we have uh, in both of cases, good, good uh, results to, to, to present. And so uh, this is uh, our uh, scattering in, in, in the memorandum of understanding. And oh, thank you. That I try to to keep it the, the timeline. Okay, Marco. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, to the whole audience, I'll, I beg your pardon. We had a problem. Um, our moderator uh, couldn't make it, so I'm taking on the role of moderation. So I, I ask for your patience on any adaptive movement I have to make here. So uh, now I'd like to invite <clears throat> Bert de Bievre. Bert is the technical secretary of FONAG, the Quito Water Fund. Bert has 29 years of experience in the tropical Andes. For more than 10 years, he worked in the academia at the Universidad de Cuenca, Ecuador, where he helped to form what is now a consolidated research group on soil and water management with an emphasis on Andean hydrology. Subsequently, Bert worked for 10 years leading projects in Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru, focused on Andean ecosystems such as the Paramo, where watershed management and hydrology of Andean catchment. In a two-year mission, Based on Condesan in Lima, Peru, he has uh, been advising the Peruvian Ministry of Environment and Drinking Water Regulators, SUNAS, on the design and implementation of policies supporting incentives and compensation for hydrological ecosystem services. Since October 2005, he leads FONAG in the fulfillment of its mission of conserving and restoring the source water areas for Ecuador high altitude capital Quito. Bert holds a PhD in applied biological sciences and a master's degree in watershed resources engineering and a degree in civil engineering from Katholieke Universi Universiteit Leuven in Belgium. So Bert, thank you very much. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Claudio. Um, thank you for this invitation from DNC. Um, yes, uh, Quito's Water Fund, uh, FONAG, um, was uh, created already 22 years ago. It's the oldest water fund in the world. Um, I'm leading its technical team now for, for seven years. Um, in its mission for south source water conservation and restoration. No? Quito's waterfront uh, mission is very clear. It's about uh, conservation and restoration of um, watershed and the sources for different users in the catchment where uh, Quito's, Quito is located uh, in a very particular um, topographical and challenging uh, se uh, setting. No? Um, we, we have a, um, the characteristic of uh, high altitude, but of course the, the characteristic of uh, high mountains. The we Western Cordillera um, and the Eastern Cordillera that separate the Inter-Indian Valleys from the Amazon region and um, 
Quito is uh, the three million inhabitants in Quito are uh, supplied uh, by water for domestic use by dozens of intakes. Uh, this is not at all about one system or one subcatchment. It's about dozens of water intakes. Um, only for the city about uh, 150 uh, in the Western Cordillera, the older systems um, near the city and um, by larger uh, uh, infrastructure works um, and even uh, Amazonian headwaters uh, transfer um, intakes in the Eastern Cordillera. Um, this sequence of slides is about showing you um, how a water fund uh, moves in, in within a diverse uh, landscape as uh, ecologically, um, uh, hydrologically even, uh, even in, in spite of short distances, uh, uh, the hydrological regimes, for example, in Western Cordillera and the Eastern Cordillera are not at all the same. So um, um, we don't have uh, the coincidence of drought periods, for example, which is at the same time a challenge and at the same time an opportunity. Um, we have a a policy, uh, diverse policy setting as well. Uh, what's now in, on screen is the National Protected Area System. And luckily, a, a wider number of uh, water intakes and catchments are within uh, this national park system. Um, so the overlap with, with what is our priority interventions uh, uh, areas you know, is quite uh, significant. Um, uh, however, we complete that with all the type of uh, conservation um, uh, areas. The blue one on screen now is a is uh, own land, uh, the water fund, and uh, I think it's still maybe still the only one in in of the water funds it, that is a land owner, um, and we also manage land that is owned by the water utility. Uh, about 20,000 uh, hectares. Um, that's part of the strategy. Another very important part is uh, conservation agreements with uh, owners, um, communities owned or privately owned uh, land. Where uh, This is probably the part of the portfolio that is more similar to payment for environmental services. Very often it's said that FONAC is an example of payment for environmental services. I think only part of what we do is uh, really payment uh, for environmental services. Um, and then there are, there are still a few other um, types of, of, of areas that complete. So that, that makes a jigsaw puzzle of different, uh, different uh, agreements um, with different authorities, national, municipal, private, communities, and all together that builds an integrated uh, intervention for water source protection in, in a certain territory. Um, the final, a few words on the financial, uh, on the financial mechanism. Um, as the, as uh, most water funds in Ecuador, uh, FONAC is a trust fund, is a fiduciary fund uh, legally. So we have a, 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 a capital, a trust fund, where the constituents, the different constituents contribute to. There are six, a mix of public uh, companies and private uh, companies um, with a dominance of the water utility of the city of Quito. No? Since um, the contributions of the other five constituents are uh, voluntary, were voluntary at the time of uh, adhesion to the fund, while the water utility is obliged to contribute by a municipal law 2% of the water bill of, of all their income for um, uh, water um, uh, uh, monthly. No? Over, the, over the 22 years, this has been able to, con to, to add to a capital. No? And today, um, today uh, a yearly budget uh, already draws 50% of uh, its amount from the financial revenues on the capital. 
So the trust fund is invested in financial instrument that produces financial revenues and that accounts for 50% uh, of the today's yearly budget. Another 25% comes from a direct a percentage of the new contributions that goes directly to execution, to implementation. So it does not go to the capital fund. And another 25%, what we call leveraged funding from all the uh, entities, other donors that are not part of the constituents of the fund. So here we can find climate financing, we can find other private companies that that prefer not to be a constituent, also a municipal municipal uh, um, uh, funding, for example. No, So that completes the uh, yearly implementation uh, budget that has been in the last two years more than $3 million um, per year. Um, this uh, this slide also to show uh, the diversity and uh, of a portfolio of, of, of interventions. It's a wide array of interventions. Um, the own land, managing the own land as water reserves, uh, the conservation agreements, uh, the restoration uh, program, a lot about information generation and monitoring, hydrological monitoring, social ecological monitoring. Um, environmental education, um, um, contributions in uh, partnerships with research, with, with research institutions uh, to fill gaps, knowledge gaps that are uh, um, bottlenecks for efficient uh, implementation, you know? and impact monitoring. Impact monitoring, so that, that's the generation of evidence of what we really obtain with our investment and in to in this part i i would like to in 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 view of the of the content of this session i would like to go in a little bit uh, more uh, into a latest uh, work on return of uh, investment as a uh, fonac uh, we have been start we have started this type of work only um, four or five years ago so definitely, this was not a pre. Um, it was not part of feasibility study or a pre studies previous to the creation of the fund. Rather, it is uh, studies uh, in the mature phase of the fund that uh, want to um, contribute to the sustainability, showing that the, uh, there is a effective return on investment um, for the. Uh, entities that are uh, contributing. No? So what is a return on investment study? It's about, um, it's about uh, on the one hand, generating the um, hydrological uh, benefits. So we have done this work with water quantity and water quality uh, benefits um, in different scenarios. In a scenario without, um, without our uh, efforts, to conserve um, source water is that that's called a business as usual scenario and uh, comparing with a scenario where we implement a complete portfolio of protection of source water um, called a sustainable uh, ecosystem management uh, scenario no um, so this uh, this generates over time um, different uh, values for a large number of water quantity and water quality uh, parameters. And the second part of a, of a uh, return on investment study is to introduce these uh, hydrological benefits into economical benefits for a certain uh, user. We have done it until now only for the water utility of Quito, our main uh, contributor. Um, um, and we have been able, we, we, have, we have worked quite intensively with uh, a, 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 a large group of people, the technical staff of the water fund, the technical staff of uh, operations in the water utility and uh, external uh, contribution from consultants um, uh, that um, in, in, the, in the hydrological, uh, part, especially in the modeling, no. Um, uh, two minutes. Yes. Okay. yes. Um, 
in, in hydrological monitoring and uh, calibration of these uh, hydrological modeling exercises with our own monitoring. And I would like to stress that very much that this is hydrological modeling based on our monitoring program. No? Um, absolutely necessary to have credible hydrological monitoring exercises. Um, <clears throat> um, so as a, as a two slides for conclusion, um, uh, I think after 22 years, what we see is that uh, as key elements of uh, of the success of FONAC is, uh, I gave it the title, trust and commitment. Uh, and trust of, and commitment is uh, generated by the factors shown here, by adaptability, by being flexible, um, by adapting uh, to new challenges uh, in, the, in the source water. We are able in our planning, we have to, do have strategic plans for five years, but we adapt every year uh, according to new conditions. By collaboration between a lot of entities, no, uh, in the genes of, of FONAC, there are already a lot of institutions, but we collaborate with many more. The effectivity of the actions uh, should be uh, worked on every day and should be monitored. monitored. That is impact monitoring. No? Um, impact monitoring can generate on the long-term return on investment studies. Um, capacity building is absolutely necessary continuously, uh, and that's what we think builds really sustainability. No? And a few manages, messages to, to, to take away. Um, I think it's very important that we have a diverse integrated portfolio of interventions. No? And for example, not only a mega reforestation program, we are, I am actually a bit worried today that some donors focus on such a small uh, window as, for, for example, only the reforestation. That's an important part, but it is not successful if it's not integrated within a more integrated effort. Um, the return on investment analysis for us was a, is a very powerful support for the sustainability of the financial me mechanism, since we are able to show that um, the water utility has receives a return for its investment. No, it was not really an exercise of a business case or a bankable case, but it was very important to to sustain the current financial mechanism. Um, a return on investment analysis shows the water utility receives a good return, even considering only water and quality, water quality and water quantity benefits. That's what we did until today. If we would consider, and we hope to do so in the future, carbon, social, or other biodiversity co-benefits, uh, of course, return might be higher. But only with the water benefits, it is already a positive uh, return. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Bert, thank you very much for your, your presentations. Indeed, one of the most uh, impressive cases, um, the oldest water funds. Thank you very much. Um, well, um, I would like to, to welcome Hugo Alberto Contreras, which is the uh, represents Latin America Water Funds Partnership. Um, Hugo, uh, had, we had a little technical problem, so Hugo is our moderator, and I'm pleased to hand the moderator role back to you. Hugo, we had the presentation from Marco Cardoso Tsuyama from our CESP and BERT, so now Michael Webster is on the line. Thank you, Claudio, and uh, apologies uh, to the presenters and apologies to all of you, um, um, a glitch, but anyways. Uh, so let's continue with the program, and I I'd like to uh, thank Mike Webster and introduce Mike Webster to the audience. Mike is the Executive Director of the Water and Sanitation Dire Directory in the city of Cape Town. Uh, he leads the Directorate of the, uh, of the Municipality that is responsible for the full water cycle from source to tap and back to the environment. Um, Prior to joining uh, the city of Cape Town, Mike worked for the uh, World Bank for 16 years. Notable that he um, entered the bank through a young professional program. So all young professionals um, have Mike as a, as, a, uh, as a beacon of hope in this uh, very competitive uh, environment. 
Mike has extensive international experience having worked in South Asia, Europe, Central Asia, and Africa. He's an engineer and uh, um, has a, an, a master's degree in engineering as well and uh, public policy. Uh, Cape Town is a very emblematic case as it was one of the large important cities in the world that was near um, day zero uh, a couple of years ago. And I think Mike can tell us uh, good stories coming out from that uh, very difficult experience. Mike, uh, welcome and uh, thank you for, uh, for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Hugo, and uh, great to be with you. And greetings from uh, Cape Town, where it's, I think, the same time as it is in Stockholm, about uh, eight in the evening. Um, let me put on my um, presentation so long while we are uh, getting introduced. Um, please confirm that you can see the presentation and that it's, uh, it's fully visible. Hugo, can you see the presentation? No, not yet. Uh, can you see it uh, now? Mm. No, sorry, no, no on my screen. Um, oh, it's coming. Is it coming now? It It is on. Okay. And it's on present of you? No, still not. Uh, yeah, ready to go. Okay, great. Thanks very much once again. It's so that's a presenter view, of... so if you mind switching it to it, it'll be okay. Is it on presenter view? No, yes. Okay. Uh, that's a picture of uh, Table Mountain, which is the iconic uh, mountain in the middle of downtown Cape Town. This is the central business district. Um, I'm sitting in about the middle there in an, in an office building in the municipality. So we, we're going to talk about nature-based solutions for water scarcity, the Cape Town Water Fund case study. Very interesting to hear the Quito uh, Ecuador experience because a lot of similarities. I realize they uh, many years ahead of us, having done this for 29 years, but a lot of things have been um, transferred to us. So uh, just to uh, quickly introduce my directorate. Uh, as mentioned by the, the chair, we, we manage from source to tap. So from the catchments, uh, about 40, 50, 60 kilometers away, we have dams. We do our own water treatment works. We treat 1,650 megaliters a day, distributed to our customers, about 5 million customers. We've got our own wastewater treatment works uh, and back into the environment. Very busy slide, but uh, the slides will be available to you. Um, we're a large local government directorate, over 5,000 staff, uh, 75 billion rand uh, asset value. These are the big figures down uh, the right. Um, we serve about 4.7 million customers, mainly in formal uh, areas, but also um, a range in informal settlements with taps and toilets. We get our water from a regional water supply system called the Western Cape Water Supply System. From that system, which is the graph on the, the left, uh, Cape Town draws um, about 64% uh, of, of, of that system. And uh, the neighboring towns uh, get 7% and about 29% of that regional supply goes to agriculture it's quite high-end agriculture. A lot of it goes to grapes, to the wine that comes out of this region and fruit, um, relatively efficient uh, agriculture. This is the Western Cape water supply system. Uh, so this is the, the southern tip of Africa. Uh, Cape Town is the urban area at the bottom. Um, I'm sitting in an office over there looking at Table Mountain. Uh, our customers, about 5 million customers are all in this uh, urban area over here. And our dams are surrounding us uh, to the north, to the east, the bigger dam to the east, and to the, to the northeast. The system is jointly managed by the national government and the city and supplying water to agriculture and the urban areas. 
this was alluded to by the chair, um, uh, a very extreme drought uh, between 2014 and 2018, a one in 590 uh, event, uh, which nearly caused us to run out of water, the infamous day zero. Day zero meant the time by which the municipality, by which my directorate couldn't supply pipe water to um, its uh, citizens. Out of the drought, we um, we developed five key key lessons, and I don't want to go into them in detail, but just to list them out for this presentation, I think uh, is useful. We first realized that we are vulnerable to climate change. Our rainfall has uh, decreased. It's projected to decrease by further 25% over the next 30 years. We look to Perth in Australia as a sobering uh, similarity. They have the same weather system as us with cold fronts from the coast. Their uh, rainfall has decreased by 80% over the last um, 50 years. And we rely solely on uh, rainwater. So we need to diversify our sources. Second lesson, we survived the drought by dramatically reducing our demand. And I think that's the big takeaway from Cape Town. We reduced our demand by 50% from 1,000 megaliters a day to under 500 through tariffs, through demand management, through extensive communications. Third, and this is the most uh, difficult one politically, is you can't build yourself out of a drought. So there's not enough time to build a desalination plant uh, while you're in the drought. We're using the drought to build water resilience, and that means augmenting our supply and staying water efficient. But lastly, and that's the one relevant to this session, our regional source, our Western Cape water supply system needs to be better managed, including the spread of invasive alien species. We developed a strategy, and you can go online and see it, about our shared water future, and that lays out all of the commitments the city has to its, to its customers. This is where the Greater Cape Town Water Fund comes in. Uh, this is a fund set up by the Nature Conservancy together with the city. Uh, similar kind of um, uh, partners as in Quito, the city puts in um, more than 50% of the funds and we get private sector donors um, uh, contributing as well. This is primarily about reducing the spread of invasive alien plants within our catchments. So in uh, big numbers, um, we lose about 55 billion liters per year from uh, invasive alien species. If they are left to grow further by 2045, that will double to about 100 billion liters uh, per year. The business case was developed by the Nature Conservancy in 2018 uh, for the um, Greater Cape Town Water Fund, identified priority catchments within our uh, dam area, uh, and has got a business case of reclaiming about 70% of um, the losses, which is an area of about 32% of um, that Western Cape water supply system. Uh, the financing is at the heart of it. Um, the total cost for uh, all these schemes is about 370 million rand, close to $20 million. Um, this requires an initial investment of significant clearing, particularly in the upper reaches, and then the longer term uh, maintenance of those uh, clearing programs. But this is, I think, the game changer as far as um, uh, what the Water Fund has really done to our, um, our, our water resilience program. If we look at the business case for um, the uh, invasive alien species clearance, the nature-based solution is by far the cheapest uh, part of our water augmentation option. For us, it's not an either or. We're going to be doing all of the uh, expansion options. But this, uh, if we look at the um, unit reference value, which is a way of comparing uh, between different um, uh, interventions. We have a unit reference value of about two rand per cubic meter compared to desalination of about 16, water reuse of about 14, and groundwater exploration of about 10. So, um, you know, the, the next cheapest 
source of water is about five times the cost of uh, the removing the, the, the alien species. And the extent of the water that we can recover is actually greater than any of the other sources of water that uh, we are uh, using as part of our mix. In addition, there's a lot of green job opportunities. There's the potential to restore biodiversity within these catchments. Uh, and there's various other uh, green uh, advantages. So the current state is losing 50 billion uh, liters of water per year, which is around two months of our total uh, supply. And uh, the key state that we are wanting to move to uh, over the next uh, period, especially after this rapid clearing, is um, around 55 um, uh, billion liters saved. I think this is my last slide. Um, we are implementing this already. We've already cleared 25,000 uh, hectares. This is a, a net water saving of around 330 uh, uh, megaliters a day, uh, about 5% of our total supply. A lot of green jobs created. Um, we're moving to, into the next stage of financing. Most of the initial financing has come from the city itself, from my directorate, but we are looking at more sustainable ways of uh, financing this over the long term and at getting other users in the catchments, some of the agricultural users, the other uh, municipalities to contribute to that fund as well to have a long term, more sustainable financing option. So that's it. Uh, short and sweet. I know I rushed through it, but I'm fully available for questions. Uh, this is a photo of my management team from one of our key dams for which there's all this invasive alien species clearance. My contact details on the top left and feel free to email me for any further information. Thank you, Hugo. Oh, you're welcome, Mike. Um, I think this is um, um, more and more the world is realizing the power of nature-based solutions and Cape Town is maybe we wish it was all as um, as uh, profitable socially environmentally as the interventions in cape town could be uh, not not always the case but uh, i think there's more and more evidence that nature-based solutions have to play a role in managing water so now let's uh, let's move on with uh, um, and before we move on sorry guys from the audience, please uh, use chat to start writing your questions. We will have a question and answer uh, session after Claudio uh, presents. Uh, so don't forget, let's uh, make use of the great presenters that we have in front of us. So Claudio Clems is a water policy specialist at the Nature Conservancy Program in Brazil. Claudio has dedicated uh, much of his uh, time to the outreach with the public and private sector, promoting the design and support uh, and supporting management of water, fund, water funds and payment for environmental service projects. And lately he has focused on bridging the uh, sanitation sector, water utilities regulators to streamline nature-based solutions in Brazil. Claudio holds a master's degree in environmental toxicology, and it's a, a postgraduate in environmental management. Um, and he's a veterinarian, so um, a big jump from, for him, but uh, I, I think that helps us bring um, different views into the table. Claudio, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, that's a, a curiosity. Actually, I I look at cities as if they were a big patient, a big uh, organism that can be treated, can be well treated or not well treated. So that's my veterinarian perspective over watershed protection. Um, well, um, thank you. And uh, uh, as shown in the in the cases featured here in the session, we see that nature-based solution is no longer a concept that's completely absent among water utility operations. However, the large large scale incorporation of nature-based solutions into water sector uh, is still far from becoming common business practice. So, from from our experience at the, the Nature Conservancy, 
in implementing such initi initiatives, they bring some perspectives on existing barriers and, and potential solutions. Um, well, one challenge, while sanitation policies and, and businesses are essentially local, local sometimes can mean tens of thousands of people, depending on water security for their well-being and for their economies. Um, globally, urban population sums up to 4.3 billion people. So 56% of global population live in cities. In the case of Latin America and the Caribbean, 81% of people live in cities, but still nature-based solutions are less than 1% of the total investments made by the sanitation sector. Um, well, not to mention um, the urgent need to care and understand and incorporate the climate adaptation needs. According to the Brazilian National Communication to the UN, UN a framework convention on climate change. The projection for Brazil, southeastern Brazil, calls for an increase in extreme precipitation events, side by side with an overall decrease in annual precipitation, plus increase in consecutive dry days. And beside the scientific evidence that's bold, that's concrete, based on over 100 peer reviewed articles. We are witnessing this year by year, day by day. Um, so, however, several factors can contribute to, to, to make water sectors shift toward a climate uh, resilient mindset. This can be particularly challenging. Uh, so one need is to look outside of the water treatment plant walls. I think this is, this is one of the big challenges. And gray infrastructure or uh, cement and steel, while essential for quick responses, it no longer says, no, no longer solves all problems alone, especially if we look far into the future. And looking far into the future is sometimes challenging for, for water utilities uh, operations. Um, so when we look outside of, uh, of the water treatment plant walls, um, when you look uh, at, when you think of nature-based solutions, there are a wide range of possibilities of interventions uh, and their applications uh, must be considered case by, case by case. So restoration of natural ecosystems is one of them among others. Um, and just for instance, the choice of which restoration technique to, to deploy and the consequent growth rate of this res restored vegetation can affect nature-based solution effectiveness. The same uh, is true regarding how long it does to take uh, a restored ecosystem takes to achieve uh, a stage of ecosystemic maturity and fully deliver the expected hydrological benefits. So these are ele elements that are naturally uh, challenging for the current mindset on, on water utilities and the water sector overall. Um, the time frame for, for benefits to be fully realized follows a distinct pattern compared to traditional gray infrastructure. So uh, such time like between investments and realization of benefits can become a barrier to water utility managers and policy makers, which tend to seek for quick results. Well, um, let us add the climate change perspectives and its implied urgency to take action, but the landscape surrounding, surrounding cities is also changing fast. This results in a situation where decision, decisions about water management by the water sector must be made with urgency even if under uncertainty. I think this is a very important point that we are facing in our negotiation with other utilities. Decision has to be made even under uncertainty. Um, um, otherwise, like the, 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 the picture we are seeing here, what we, are, what we see as a set today for a water utility like the Cantareira Water Supply System in Sao Paulo, can quickly turn into a liability. What we see here 
is the Guarapiranga Reservoir, which also supplies the water some power population. So uh, overall, the, this rigidity of the prevailing mindsets and institutional arrangements currently represents a, 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 a big challenge. So the fact that decision, decision makers tend to choose familiar options uh, and that green infrastructure approaches are deeply ingrained into, into the sector mindset ends up shifting these this institutional practices. Um, again, looking outside of the, the, the walls of the water treatment plants, the, the, the planning of nature-based solutions must consider an ecosystem dynamics in various, various uh, spatial scales. This means that nature-based solutions implementation often require a coordination uh, of landscape scale interventions involving sometimes multiple uh, stakeholders across various different jurisdictions. And this, this can be hard to do and takes time. So engaging and negotiating with multiple stakeholders and collaborating with landowners, uh, this can be a daunting for water utilities if we think of water utilities work, working alone, but th that's not the case. Um, utilities may not have the capacity or even the legal leg legitimacy to, to engage uh, the necessary stakeholders. But they are not alone, that's the fact. The, the, the work that Nature Conservancy does, as in Cape Town, as in Quito, and other places in Sao Paulo, uh, is an example of that. So state and municipal administrations also hold the remit for coordinating supporting policies, and which ultimately impact, impact how uh, watersheds are, are managed. Let's take a look at, at the time here. Um, so, uh, while this uh, delivering such uh, watershed investments implying this high level of coordination that involves in interconnection between existing public policies, the sanitation business and its regulation, and also new policies that has to be uh, framed also other local businesses in their municipalities and their interests. So um, these are all part of this, of this complexity. So the concept of landscape planning is necessary to coordinate these multiple initiatives, including private uh, investment toward a single outcome in the long term. And this notion of the shared rules and the need for a broad-based uh, political, technical, and financial support is essential for a long-term success of such uh, watershed protection programs. I think the the um, the Quito case, the Fona case, is one very very interesting here. And just to conclude, um, here in Brazil. Uh, the Nature Conservancy together with uh, some regulators and the National um, Water Regulators Association uh, have designed um, a white paper, this legal study that went over all the, the Brazilian uh, legal framework, trying to highlight that there is no hurdle, there is no obstacle for the sanitation sector to take this leadership role. So this is uh, a document that we produced as a first approach to make it clear that such leadership is something that, that is expected. Um, I'm, I'll I'm finishing here. So uh, thank you very much, Hugo. I think we can go for. Thank you, Claudio. Thank you very much. And um, I guess one of the um, things that's always on my mind when I think of nature-based solutions and how to scale them is certainly how do we make the case, and not only the technical case, but how do we convince our stakeholders that we are on the right path? And uh, uh, while we wait for, for questions to arrive at the chat, let me just uh, summarize a couple of things that I've heard. Uh, 
We understand that there is increasing evidence of the relevance of nature-based solutions for watershed resiliency and water security. Uh, as we've seen in the cases presented, investing in, uh, in nature-based solutions is, it does not only make sense from an environmental perspective or from a, 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 a marketing perspective, but also makes a lot of sense from an economic perspective. We saw very clear numbers in the case of Cape Town and in the case of, um, uh, of Quito, and certainly there are starting to develop numbers for the case of Sao Paulo. In short, investing in nature-based solutions is um, very competitive, if not more competitive, if we bring, as Bert mentioned, the co-benefits of the investments in nature-based solutions as compared to traditional solutions. Um, again, particularly when we internalize all these co-benefits. Um, finally, um, water security and achieving water security or mitigating uh, the risk of water security are a complex issue. Uh, we need a systems approach. We need to look at the different elements of the, uh, of the equation. Mike uh, already mentioned and presented the, the, the um, uh, I think that the, um, uh, if, I, if I don't forget, if I, if I remember right, the first thing he said was, we need to diversify. And diversify means uh, tackling different elements, different stakeholders and different sectors. Uh, and here's one challenge that we find. Um, water funds or water utilities uh, are not all of the authorities uh, involved. Uh, Mike already spoke about wine producers. I'm sure wine producers in, in South Africa are a strong group of stakeholders and they have their own um, capacity to deal with, uh, with authorities and, and, and lobby for their own benefits. Uh, uh, so uh, this is just an example of how things get complicated. So we need this systems approach. And we also need to understand that uh, there's a full suite of solutions, not only uh, nature-based solutions, but we need to combine them. Um, so uh, I, I see there are uh, two questions in the chat. Um, sorry, um, Claudio, can you read them? Because I'm not seeing them. I continue to have in these technical glitches, um, certainly. Yes, sure. Um, here we have Anna Diarvar. Uh, I think I pronounced it correct, right? Uh, what, does the what was the invasive species, she asks? How do you maintain the area? Question to Cape Town. And then uh, a second question from Tyler Smith, also to, to Michael. Are native flora planted where invasive species are removed to decrease erosion and the amount of sediment going to the catchments? Mike, can you help us? And then uh, we'll provide more questions to Bert and Marco. Okay, can you just repeat the second question on the, if I got it, it's around, um... No, the first question, what was the invasive species? How do you maintain the area? The, the second one, yeah. And the second, are native flora planted? Uh, are native flora planted where invasive species are removed to decrease erosion and the amount of sediment going into the catchments? Okay, okay, good questions, thank you. Um, so look, I'm, 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 I have to admit, I'm not an expert in, in, in that side of it. Uh, I run this large water utility and my day to day is, is taken up by, by uh, other things. And uh, I hope I don't get too much of the information wrong, but um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a rather simplistic response. So the invasive alien species are primarily pines and eucalyptus. Um, you know, a lot of the um, uh, trees that came uh, with the British uh, in uh, 200 years ago, uh, I think you get them in a lot of um, former British colonies. I've seen them all over India and Sri Lanka and Australia. I think they're mainly Australian trees, but predominantly pines and, and eucalyptus. They're very thirsty. They take up a lot of water relative to their production. They are used for uh, forestry. 
um, but um, those are the trees. How do they cut them down? They use chainsaws, they use um, uh, labor. Uh, it's, it's an extensive labor program. So a lot of the value we get from it as well is in um, creating a lot of job opportunities. We have major unemployment problems in Cape Town and in, and in the country. Um, the, the tricky part of the, of the clearance is actually in the upper reaches because um, a lot of the plants are in rocky areas where you actually need ropes and quite technical work to uh, get a chainsaw up there. And the crews go in by helicopter and spend uh, two weeks at a time uh, doing the clearing. So they, they sleep out uh, in a tent with a, with a chainsaw, uh, cut the trees down, um, they do leave those trees there. They don't, uh, you know, um, fill them. There has been a separate project where they're actually putting those trees into a pulp and using them as uh, a housing uh, frame, but that's not done at scale. That's more of an experimental stage. How is it maintained? Um, taking out the saplings, taking out little trees as they, they come up. Um, they're not using uh, any uh, any kind of um, chemicals, um, but they are um, essentially going through all of those areas and taking out the little saplings as they as they come. I hope I answered the questions. Thank you, Mike. And and just remember, one of the uh, photographs that Mike had was was one of these uh, staff uh, climbing and getting on ropes, trying to get uh, the species cleared. Um, extreme uh, activities, I assume. And let me just continue with you, Mike, and let me change the, the take that uh, question and take it a bit further. How were you able to get the buy-in from authorities and stakeholders? Because at the end, at the end of the drought, when the day zero was gone, was still lingering around there, and you came out and said, look, guys, we're going to give you water by taking out trees. That's counterintuitive because we always think that trees bring water. So how do you actually went out and said, look, trees are important, but tree living with the, without these trees is more important. So the, the, the other, so the drought was a major trauma to the city and uh, to everyone living in it and into the municipality. And, created a big trust deficit between ourselves and our um, customers. Um, and there was a lot of noise around um, blaming everyone for, for various things. Um, the rich suburb blamed the big influx of poor people from the Eastern Cape uh, as using too much of water. The poor people blame the rich people for using uh, water, you know, in their gardens and in their swimming pools. The municipality blamed national government not to plan more uh, dams and augmented supply. National government said that local government failed through not uh, keeping their um, leaks uh, in check. Politicians said the administration uh, didn't plan, etc. You, you get the drift. <laughs> so a big part of the strategy was really to try and re-establish trust with uh, all segments of society. And so that photo I showed you of uh, the cover of our water strategy called Our Shared Water Source, Our, Sh our Shared Water Future, was a massive uh, PR campaign to try and explain the nature of the drought, to explain what it is that uh, caused it, and what it is that we're doing to prevent it going forward. And at its core, the strategy uh, uses the language of commitments. So it says to our authorizing environment, to politicians, to our customers, we committed to five things. And one of those five things is we going to prevent uh, the city uh, falling prey to any future drought. And we're gonna do it by wise water use, so keeping our demand uh, down by building future supply, 300 megaliters a day of groundwater aquifers, reuse, desalination, and by improving our regional uh, water supply system. And at the core of the improving the regional water supply system 
is keeping the catchments clear of these invasive species. So um, not everyone uh, uh, sort of welcomes that that message. Uh, there's are there's agriculturalists in the catchment that say that affects um, you know bee populations and that affects uh, various agricultural issues. Um, our politicians were sufficiently convinced for the city to put in money in there. Our customers, um, you know, it's it's never a consensus, but it's enough of a um, a groundswell of satisfaction to allow us to continue. So I know that's a long-winded answer, but um, it's chipping away, creating trust, and including this as one of the elements in a suite, in a diversified approach of um, of resilience. Thanks, Mike. Um, and let me move on. Uh, there's a there's a question from the audience, and let me, uh, Marco. Um, the question has to do with how regulation drives the use of nature-based solutions. And I know Sao Paulo is moving towards adopting na nature-based solutions with the drive of the regulator. So how do you drive the regulator to internalize nature-based solutions and how the regulator can make the case to the companies it regulates that it makes sense to invest in nature-based solutions? So uh, tell us a little bit of uh, what's your take on this, Marco. Uh -huh. Basically, I, I, we, I have, I've used to work on the turf, um, the turf uh, vision, you know, I, when in our model, when when uh, we have uh, we set a turf, and we we have a four period revision and so at that time you have to decide what what is this, what are are the costs you you know and uh, uh, sometimes some people used to say well that would be the minimal uh, costs will represent the minimal cost but if if you do that if you get the minimal response also you have you have the you 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 would not care properly uh, some 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 installation for instance so it's it's it not it's not make sense i think that the the, the uh, comprehensive to to understand the high, the high level, the, the high comprehension of the state. And so, if you don't, if you don't uh, in in your chain supply, how could you assure that you deliver um, the proper product, the proper good? I don't think that's it. You know that that's the, that's the sense. I think that you can in, uh, uh, can consider the the cost of the the, the nature based uh, preserving conservation and uh, in the tariff because it's that's the good that. Uh, is delivered the water, the proper water, and so it's it's, it's, it's it, if you consider the energy, for instance, you you have to buy the, the energy. Any any you have to buy the if it's it's from oil, it's from uh, solar. You have to to buy. You have to. to uh, comply with this way, I think. It's different from energy and water supply. Water supply, no costs at all, or a little costs if you consider some, uh, some but a little, very little costs, you, you, you can compare 
the costs of the, the energy, effectively the energy, not the distribution or transmission, and the, the, the cost of water, for instance. That's the, 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 the problem, I think. You have to, to inside, uh, you have to, to consider the, 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 the cost of the, the water, the costs of the water, the, the raw water, because this is, is important. And I think that's the, we, we I think that is, is consolidated, consolidated. Uh, Marco, I think he froze. No, but uh, no. it was not, it was a very long and harsh. Mm. Sorry, um, did, sorry, Marco, did you finish? Uh, because you froze for a second, at least in my computer. No, no, that's, uh, I think it was a harsh, uh, harsh uh, and difficult fight, but it, I think that is consolidated now. Uh, I think that uh, uh, everything is going to, to consider the, the, the book, uh, water supply as a cost in the in the regulator I the regu regulator uh, um, provides serves water. Okay, thank you, Marco. And let let me jump to Bert. Bert, um, one of the, the nature-based solutions take time to deliver their benefits, so you need patience. Uh, how do you convince? your stakeholders to be patient, and if it makes sense to scale or accelerate the implementation on the ground. We have a couple of minutes. Bert, uh, sorry for, for asking you to be short, but uh, please, Bert, how do you ask us to be patient and wait for the results? Um, let me question your hypothesis that there were all, that is always long-term. Uh, I think uh, there are a few things that have short-term effects. Um, and I, I would be very curious, but probably no time anymore to see if they, uh, how, uh, on what term do they expect in South Africa, the hydrological impact, I think might be quite soon. Um, of course, if we, we always talk, we always think about reforestation and trees that have to grow and that okay, and this kind of intervention, we will see impact in 10 years, in 15 years, I agree. But part of our portfolio is also a, to have, a, for example, the threat or pressure reduction, no? And when, it, when we take away, for example, livestock from, critical areas, and that is an important part of our portfolio, the impact is short term. Um, so, and I think this kind of uh, impact uh, is often forgotten. And uh, of course, it's very useful to convince people of the, of the, the usefulness of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of our interventions, no? Um, um, it, 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 and it's sometimes an impact that doesn't require to, it, it's even easy to quantify, it doesn't require complicated hydrological modeling or whatever. No, we have had a, a few a few examples. Um, we have even had an example of, I, I, I told you that there are so many intakes, no? Um, where the impact of a certain intervention of reduction of uh, elimination of sheep was really in a short area, a very small thing. Uh, uh, elimination of sheep, and it allowed the water company to use again an intake that they had already given up. No, very easy to quantify. Z from zero to a certain uh, flow of uh, that that can be used by the water utility. So, uh, so sorry, Hugo, Hugo, to 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 challenge your hypothesis. Uh, that that doesn't take away that there are a lot of other things that are long term. But that's an optimistic view, as in the case of Cape Town, that it's not going to take long. So uh, I'm sorry, uh, we are running out of time. Um, thank you very much uh, 
Marco, Bert, Mike, Claudio, and particularly the audience for being interested in this topic and joining us. Uh, we will be having some other opportunities from the Nature Conservancy to discuss about nature-based solutions, regulation, uh, return on investment. So thank you very much on my side. Uh, enjoyed the session and for the audience, I hope you did as well. Um, and have a great evening for those in, in Europe and Africa and good rest of the day for, for us in, in America. Goodbye. Thanks everyone, bye-bye. Thank you.